Here we are again, this is Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. I sit down many, many a time in front of this computer not knowing exactly where God is going to send me. Sometimes I do too much study of too many things and at at one time and then I sit down in front of here and my mind's a jumble and I'm all messed up and I'll get, I'll get Noah in the Ark of the Covenant and I'll get the Ark of the Covenant and Noah's Flood and those are two different arts by the way in the Bible and so we need to be careful another thing is we need to not uh, refrain or, or worry about using somebody else's helps I have a, a chart before me called the Mosaic Prophecies in the Psalm, or the Messianic, excuse me, the Messianic Prophecies in the Psalm. This is the prophecies of God sending His Son, Jesus Christ, as a Savior on this earth. And for every one in the Psalm, there is an answer in Matthew for that. Now, when Jesus went to the cross, 303 prophecies were fulfilled from the Old Testament. There is no other book, nowhere, anywhere, that even would begin to touch one speck of the truth of God's Word, the Bible. There is no other book anywhere in the world that would even begin, you could come bring up against the, the, the Bible. It is unreal the prophecies with with ten powers uh, to one uh, on it uh, of what the fulfilling of the prophecies that were fulfilled all at one time here and at the cross and just we're going to read a few of them today we're going to start in in the book of Psalms because that's where we are we're going to be looking at the Psalms we're going to be looking at the prophecies of the Son of God from the signs. We're going to start in Psalm 2 and verse 7. In Psalm 2 and verse 7, we're going to flip our pages and show you this is how it's done. This is how you work. Chapter 2 and verse 7. He said, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, You are my Son. And the Lord did say that. He said to John the Baptist when he baptized Jesus. He said, I'm well pleased with my son. And Jesus was the son of God. He was with God in the beginning. If you go to chapter 8 of Proverbs and read that last half of that chapter, Jesus is that wisdom. Total wisdom is Jesus Christ. He is that wisdom. God will announce Christ to be his son. In Matthew 3 and 17, he did that. Matthew 3 and 17 was the fulfillment of that. And so, we're turning over to Matthew chapter 3, right here. And this is how you go. This is how you look in your Bible. You find a helper, uh, a thing like this little chart I have in front of me, that's a helper. It doesn't give me the scriptures, it just gives me the place where they are. And I've got to look them up. I've got to be a good steward. And by the way, there is no better way for you to get acquainted with God's precious book, His Word, the water of life, the bread of life, the thing that will make you satisfied in your life is the bread of life. And the only way you're going to do it is get in it and start flipping the pages. Can you find the book of Matthew? Do you know that it is the first book in the New Testament? And can you find it? In chapter 3 and verse 17, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Wow. Here's the prophecy back in chapter 2 of Psalms. Here's the answer all the way up in the book of Matthew. When the beloved son comes out and walks on the earth in the flesh. 
Listen to this now. In the flesh. Listen to me, Brother Peter. He came on this earth in the flesh. God in the flesh. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. The Trinity. The three are one. We are three. I am a body, I am a soul, and I am a spirit. My soul and my spirit, if you please, today, by the way, is standing before the Father. Already positionally standing before the Father. I am to bring this body under subjection. And to bring this body under subjection, I am to use it to please God. Now let's look at another thing. We have other scriptures here behind this first one. And I'm not going to look at all of them. But they're all, they all uh, relate to Jesus coming and doing what God said, that he was his son. Now we're going to look at all things were put under Christ's feet. Psalm 8 and Psalm chapter 8 and verse 6. So we're going to go over there, chapter 8 and verse 6. He said, Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Wow. <laughs> uh, God gave his son dominion over the world that he made. Jesus was with God when God spoke into existence this earth. And this little world here. We are in the eyes of God in the distance away that God's heaven is. This earth is not but one atom. If you please, this earth to God is one atom. Is it full of atoms? Yes, it's got trillions and quadrillions, ten times a uh, ten power quadrillion uh, atoms. Yes, all inside of one atom, the earth. <laughs> That's God's atom. That's God's atom. And he named Adam, Adam, by the way, the first man. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? He named him Adam, Adam. And here we are, all made up of atoms. We're all, we all have the sin nature, too, by the way, from the first Adam that was passed down. We all have that sin nature, and we need to do away with that by asking Jesus to forgive us our sin, come in our heart, and that'll do away with that sin nature. Now let's look at the... The uh, answer to 8 and 6 is in 1 Corinthians 15 and 27. How do we find 1 Corinthians? We, go, we start flipping through our New Testament and we look for it. And it's along in here somewhere. We found Galatians. We found 2 Corinthians. Now, wow, there it is. That's 1 Corinthians right there. And 1 Corinthians... Uh, 15 and 27 is what our chart says to look at. So here is 15, and here is verse 27 in front of our eyes. It said, For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he said all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. Wow. God entrusted every single thing. All. A-L-L. -L. You know what all means? It means everything. All means everything. It's just like empty means empty. Full means full. All means everything. He put everything in the hands of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. God put everything in His hands. And God said... If you come to be my child, you're going to have to come through my son. Uh, you remember Jesus said in that great prayer in the garden, All of those that you've given me, Lord, I've lost none. None. He's lost none. All that were given him by the Father, he had lost none. Wow. Man. He had twelve disciples. The only one that went away was the son of perdition. And he was not God's in the first place. He was an imposter. And so, here we are back in. Let's look. 
Christ will resurrect from the grave. Psalm 16 and 10. Let's look at Psalm 16 and 10. We're traveling through the Psalms now, looking at the prophecies of Jesus Christ coming on this earth. Psalm 16 and 10. It said, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. <laughs> wow. Corruption. Corruption. You want to you want to have a picture of corruption? Take a tomato out of the refrigerator. Take it out back and put it on the banister uh, of the porch and let it sit there for a couple days. You will see corruption. <laughs> You'll see corruption bad. <laughs> and uh, this is what God said. He said he, he may go to the grave. Jesus may go to the grave and he's going to leave the cross and go to the grave. But he's not going to see corruption. He's going to raise up and walk out of that grave and live forever with the Father which is in heaven. And it goes on to say now, the answer to this is in Mark 16, 6 and 7. Now we went from the book of Matthew. Here we are in Psalms, and we're progressing in Psalms from one Psalm to another. And now we're going over into the New Testament, and we're progressing in the New Testament, one book behind the other, and we're going on. And it's given us the answer to these things. After Matthew comes the book of Mark in the New Testament. Now, who were these guys, Matthew and Mark? They were guys that Jesus called to be disciples. And he called them from different walks of life, and he allowed them to pin down some words, the words of Christ, the words that Jesus himself said. And they, they were witnesses in the flesh of Jesus walking in the flesh on this earth. These were personal witnesses that wrote this down. Now we're looking at Mark 16. I haven't quite got there yet. 8, 12, 13, 14, 15, wow, 16. We found out two things. When we got to Mark 16, we found out it was the last chapter in Mark, meaning there are 16 chapters in Mark. Make mental notes of things that you're doing. When you're studying your Bible and you're going through it, make mental notes. Because I, I couldn't have somebody said to me how many chapters in Mark today. I could tell them, but tomorrow I'd be forgot it probably because I'm getting old and I'm forgetting things. But when I was younger, I could have remembered it. But there are 16 chapters in Mark in 20 verses. Wow, if I was a young man again, I always like to mark that, that deal. The 16 chapters in 20 verses at the end of the 16th chapter. Now, in Mark 16, 6 and 7, let's read that. It said, And he said unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Hey, they're looking in the tomb, and they're looking where they laid him. He ain't there. He's gone. And nobody stole him away. That was a lie of the devil. Remember, those guys, those soldiers of that day, paid people to say that his body had been stolen. And do you know if it had been, those soldiers would have got killed. If they lost a prisoner in that day, they got killed. So you knew it was a lie, and they didn't get killed. All right, six. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. And there shall you see him as he said you would. And they went quickly and fled from the sepulchre, for they trembled and were amazed Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that uh, he had been, she had been with him 
as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. After that, he appeared another form unto them, two of them, as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue of the rest of them, neither believed they then. After he appeared unto the eleven, as they said it meet, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not. They which had seen him after he was risen. <laughs> These guys saw him. They couldn't believe their eyes. Let's see you and I not get uh, over-pious and over-righteous because we know the word and say, well, if I'd have been there, I'd have believed him. No, you wouldn't have. You'd have been just like the eleven. <laughs> Remember, Judas was gone, and all eleven disciples were there. And here was Jesus in their midst. Now listen to this. And he said, Go ye into all the world, and preach this gospel, or the gospel, to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, in the early days of Christianity was different than today. Today, many of the things that were during those that period of time, the first 30 years of the apostles going out, the disciples going out, were different than today. Many of these things would cease. Paul himself said, many of the things that were there that day would cease. I can tell you one thing that hasn't ceased, and that's the new tongue. I'm speaking with a new tongue. Before I was saved, the tongue I spoke with, cursing, swearing, lying, cheating, stealing, that was the manner of my conversation. After I got saved, all that left me. I speak now with a new tongue, a spiritual tongue, a tongue that Jesus would have me speak with. I haven't got but just to the third thing here. I must move on. God will forsake Christ in his moment of agony. agony. Psalm 22 and 1. Let's look at that. Flip the pages to Psalm 22. And as you flip your pages to Psalm 22 and 1, read it. It said, The king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation, how great shall he rejoice. Wow. This is God the Father. The king. God the Father. The king. And we in the right chapter and verse, we are 22 and 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Wow. Let's see. That word roaring is the ultimate end of a man laying on the bed dying. The person dying. And Jesus was in his roaring moment on the cross and at that very moment that he was dying the father had to turn his head against his son and when he turned his head it got dark for three hours three solid hours early in the afternoon it got total pitch black dark a man couldn't see his hand in front of his face for three solid hours Jesus took the sin of the world upon him. I, you say sin, S-I-N. All of the sin lumped into one apple, one sin. All was sin, all of the sin. It took three hours to take all of that sin. If you could picture this, picture this. All the bees on the earth headed to one spot all at one time. 
All the bees on the earth, everything that could fly, for instance, even, all headed to one spot at one time. Why, the skies were totally black. The sin of this world, which is darkness, was totally black. And God had to turn his head on his son because he can't look on the sin. For three hours he took that on him. There was a great earthquake. There was a great shaking of the earth. There was great fear on the earth during that period of time. And he took that sin. Matthew 27 and 46. Let's flip back over to Matthew chapter 27 and 46. Flip your pages now. Back over and look at it. 27 and verse 46. Six, and you look at it for yourself. Don't just believe Brother Peter, even though I'm going to do my best throughout my life to use the Word of God for everything I say. By the way, uh, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I got about thirteen Bibles right here in front of me, and they're all King James versions. They're versions that were put together by other people, all different kinds of people, but they're all King James Version. They all have different footnotes in them, have different references on the sides, and I can trace down anything I want. When one Bible doesn't give me what I'm looking for, I pick up another one. And when that doesn't give me what I'm looking for, I pick up another one. When that doesn't, I pick up another one. If I'm looking for something that I know is supposed to be there, somebody else has crossed that bridge, and I'm going to find it where I can back up what I'm saying. I don't try to say anything of my own volition. I try to say it with a backup of somebody else. Now we're going to Matthew 27 and 39. 27 and 39. And it said, And they that passed by reviled him and wagged their heads. That was a Jewish custom, to revile a man and wag your head. Like this, wag your head. That's a Jewish custom. Still is, by the way. Still is. That 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 is a that's a bad omen for a man, for another Jewish man to come by and wag his head at you, uh, and and they and do this, uh, th this and that's a custom. And let's read uh, 39 to 43. And okay, so we read 39. Now, number 40, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocked him with the scribes and the elders. Listen to this. These are the guys that were given the position to hold the fort for God to bring his son into the world, the priest. And they wagged their heads at him. He saved others himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. Wow. Hey, do you know these guys that say in this don't realize that Jesus took the sin that is in them? away already and all they have to do now is say forgive me Jesus and that sin is gone wow Jesus took that sin he trusted in God let him deliver him now if he will have him for he said I am the son of God the thief also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth that was the thief on the other side. The one thief said, <laughs> uh, Deliver me, Jesus. And he said, You'll be with me today in paradise. Wow. Do you know how one, one way we knew that Jesus went to paradise? Because he told him, he said, You're going to be with me today in paradise. <laughs> how about that? The first guy going with Jesus to paradise. Wow. Wow. Ah, okay. So we see that. We see everything so far that was quoted in Psalms fulfilled in the New Testament. Quoted to a couple thousand years before, and it comes all about just exactly like it's quoted. Hey, there is no other 
religion. Besides, besides Christianity, there is no other way to God. Except through Jesus Christ, there is no other way to God. But all other religions, all of their books, do not draw conclusions. Do not draw the conclusion that the Bible draws. The Bible draws all, every single last one of its thousands of prophecies in the Old Testament came true in the New Testament. And are coming true today before your very eyes. Before your very eyes, the Bible said the wickedness that will be on this earth. That children hating their parents, parents hating their children. Uh, they'd be uh, truce breakers, haughty, high-minded. All of the things it says that's going to happen is happening right now. The church itself of Jesus Christ, the real church, the very statement I just made, the only way to heaven is through the Son of God, the devil refutes that, and he's, all other religions refute that. All other religions say, not so. And they follow that a little way. I've got a thing I bought this week that gives all the religions of the world. My goodness, if those people could read about all the religions of the world, step back and read about Christianity, they would find the truth. Because Christianity is the only book, the Bible is the only book that draws a complete conclusion. <laughs> a complete conclusion. Every single prophecy that was put out in the Old Testament that has been fulfilled, has been fulfilled, and the rest will be full of the same. Exactly. We're headed toward a thousand year millennial reign on this earth. And then this earth is going to be taken by the hand of God and cast into the lake of fire to burn forever and ever and ever. And he is going to make a new heaven and a new earth. How many times do you think God has done that? I don't know. He's God. He's been eternal. He's been eternal forever. <laughs> He can make all the earth he wants to. He can make all the places he wants to. And he could have some other earth right now somewhere else with people on it and everything else and we can't even get our telescopes to find them because God is so great and so far away and he can't fathom his depth. Man can't fathom the depth of God. He can't do it. Yet God was willing to send his son down here and to come himself down here through his son and deal with little finite man, we were made to worship him. I look at the ants down here by the millions, and I say, we look like the ants to God by the millions. I we obedient. The ant is obedient. You know that the, the God gave a good com commendation to the ant. He said the ant has never left its proper state. God designed it to do exactly what it does, and it does it. It has not deviated from its what it does. If there's an ant that deviates from what it does, the other ants kill it. They're not going to change their system. It's complete, it's right, it works. It will work until the earth is gone, done. And so let's look at our next thing. And uh, the... the uh, Five, uh, he will be a scorned and ridiculed. That was in uh, Matthew twenty-seven thirty-nine. All right, six. Christ's hands and feet will be pierced. Uh, Psalm twenty-two and sixteen. Psalm twenty-two and sixteen. The dogs have compassed me, and the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. He was not talking about dogs, dogs. He was talking about the devil's dogs, about human beings that had become worse than savage dogs, and they pierced his hands and feet without remorse, laughing and joking, and some of those standing there 
taking his robe that they couldn't part, casting dice for his robe, while they nailing his hands and his feet to the cross. And this was done, and we're going to look at where it was done. And this, by the way, uh, is in John chapter 20 and verse 25. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is the third book, the book of John. And where did we say it was? We said it was in John chapter 20. John chapter 20. This is how you study your Bible, by the way. This is how you study your Bible. You get it out, and you go from one reference to another, and you put your fingers in the book. I know that you've got a telephone, and I know that you can press up these scriptures in your telephone, but you're leaving out the important thing. You're leaving out one of the most important things, and that is to thumb through your Bible. That is to find what you need to find in your Bible. Now, because you are watching this on the computer, you can mark this particular excerpt, and you can come back to it. It's going to be a now along no matter what I do, I can't boil it down less than an hour. And so it's going to be an hour long, but you can come back and watch ten minutes of it at a time. Get your Bible out. Use it for a devotion if you want to, but follow through with it. Now we're looking at John 20 and verse 25. John 20 and verse 25. And we're reading this in 25. It says... The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my fingers in the prints of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Wow. Do you know this was Thomas? Thomas had the name Didymus, of doubter. He was a doubter. And because he was a doubter, he said, Hey, boys, I ain't going to believe it unless I can thrust my hand in his side and put my fingers in his, the holes in his hands and feet. I don't going to believe it's him. And that was Thomas, the great doubter. And don't be a doubter. Don't be a doubter, and don't be, if you're a doubter, you'll be a powder. You won't believe the Bible. You won't believe anything in the Bible. You won't believe what the Bible says if you're a doubter. Uh, because, hey, the Bible's the truth. It cannot be refuted by man. The devil himself cannot refute the Bible. This is the only true and living book on the earth. The true and living book. This is a living book. It's a living book. Jesus said, I, in the beginning, I was with the Father. And in the beginning, I was the Word. I became flesh, and I dwelt among you. I went back to the Father, and I became the Word again. And I leave you this Word, written, penned down by the Holy Spirit, over a period of 1,600 years by 40 different authors. And all by the, led by the Holy Spirit. You, you or I couldn't sit down and uh, I'm here where I am and you're up somewhere wherever you are and I write a chapter and you write a chapter and we put them together and see if they match. They wouldn't look nothing like they would, they would not No two words would even match. Yet God made from Genesis to Revelations all fit and tie together. It's like reading one novel all the way through. You're reading one book all the way, 66 books that are one book all the way through. All fitly joined together like five fingers on a hand. All fitly joined together just like five fingers on a hand. That's how positive it is. It is a fitly joined together the words, Jesus himself, if you please. You're handling him. You want to handle the nail prints, the nails and the hole in his side? Pick his book up. You have the ability. You have him in your hand. You have Jesus 
with you. You can have him in your heart and you can have him in your hand. I must get on. Well, we're going to go now to others will gamble for Christ's robe. 22 and 18. Uh, Psalm 22 and 18. They will gamble for his clothes. That's the seventh thing. Psalm 22 and and verse 18. It said, They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Wow. <clears throat> I'm, hey, I'm reading things out of the book of Psalms written down by uh, different people. David uh, perhaps penned all of these. I don't know. Solomon might have penned some of them. I haven't gone back to study that. But whoever put them down, they got that from the Holy Spirit. Talking about Jesus. Do you know why God had all of these things written down in the Old Testament before the New Testament came? They were the witness before the action. These words are the witness that it was the truth. And it was not given so much for you and I. We're Gentiles that were grafted in. It was given for the Jew. So that the Jew could not miss Jesus. They could not miss the Messiah. The, their their uh, 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 Messiah. They could not miss him. Except the devil came and blinded their eyes. And Jesus said, because of your stiff neck and your hard heart, I'm going to leave it that way. I'm going to leave your eyes blinded. If you don't want to believe, you can be like Thomas. Only thing is, I let Thomas put his hand in my, my uh, side and in my hand and feet. But I'm not going to let you do that. Because you don't believe. Because of your unbelief, I'm going to let you live in your unbelief. And even today... There are some Messianic Jews. That is a Jewish person who believes that this Jesus was. And by the way, <clears throat> if any one of those Jews right now that don't believe would be honest with themselves and get this King James Version Bible out and follow through with the very scriptures that their forefathers wrote, and the very things that forefathers wrote and the priests did and everything and follow through and read it in the New Testament, they would believe in Jesus. There is no other alternative. There's no other alternative. It all points to Jesus. There's no other alternative. There is no other. There is nobody else in the whole wide world that can even begin to come up with this. So they gambled. Matthew 27, 35. Let's flick over there right quick. Matthew 27 and 35. Uh, Matthew 12. <clears throat> Matthew 17. Uh, 21. 23. 24. 25. 26. Ha ha ha. <laughs> what do you think comes up next? 27. How about that? And uh, so in 27, and what verse? Matthew 27 and uh, uh, 35. Let's look at verse 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. Wow. Let me tell you a little story. That right here in the sign, this prophecy right here in the sign, is only one place in the Old Testament where the same prophecy is. This very same prophecy is several times by several different prophets in the Old Testament. The same prophecy. By the way, every one of these prophecies is time and time again in the Old Testament. 
We're just reading them out of one place, out of Psalms. But Ezekiel, Isaiah, Job, everybody, every single one of the prophets prophesied Jesus coming and something about his coming. And every single solitary one of them prophecies was fulfilled when he came. Man, that would be like you going down and buying five lottery tickets and every one of them be the winner. The big prize winner. Just go buy five lottery tickets, one right behind the other, and all of them be the big prize winner. That's what that would be like. You say, that's impossible, Peter. Yes, it is, but this Bible's not. Because it's God's book, and God, and everything is possibility with God. <laughs> Everything's possible with God. We got to get on. We're not making a lot of headway today, but we got to get on. <clears throat> not one of his bones were broken. Psalm 34. We're in 24. We got to go 10 more Psalms to 34. And. We got to see in, in 34, Psalm 34 and 20, verse 20, it said, He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Do you know that that line of crosses that day that were up there on that mountain, that, that, that we only see a picture of three, but there were more, but do you know that every one of those except Jesus, their legs were broke? That the legs were broken of everyone except Jesus. That was a custom to break their legs. And they did not break the legs of Jesus. What with, with the leg, breaking of the legs was the final. The final thing to guarantee. That man ain't coming off that cross and walking nowhere. He ain't coming off that. If he's a breathing a one breath, he ain't moving. He ain't going nowhere. His legs was broke. The final thing was supposed to carry them on through to their death. But none of his bones were broken. John 19 and verse 32. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John 19 and John 19. And let's look at our thing. 32, 33, and 36. All right. 32 it says here. Uh, then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the others which were crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they broke not his legs. Wow. The only man hanging on the cross of that day that they didn't break the legs of. And that was prophesied back in the book of Psalms. By the way, it's prophesied in many other places too. Let's get on. We are in now, we are going to the ninth thing. Christ will be hated unjustly. Uh, Psalm 35 and 19. Let's read that. Let not them that are mine enemies wrongfully rejoice over me. Neither let them wink with the eye that hate me without a cause. Man. Do you know that people hated him without a cause? And still do, by the way. People hate the name of Jesus without a cause. They don't have any reason to hate the name of Jesus, but they do, other than the devil. Without a cause, they hate him. There's no cause to hate him, and they hate him. I can go to places like, when, for instance, when I was up in, in another state, and I prayed openly out loud with some people. And a man came to me and told me, you do that again and we'll put you in jail. We'll put you in jail you do that again. They hate Jesus now. The world hates Jesus. The devil hates Jesus. The devil wants everybody in hell and God would like to have everybody in heaven. So, here we are. The devil hates Jesus. I must get on. All right. Uh, none of his bones were broken. And we were, we were uh, in God's will. And we were in, and they hated him unjustly. 
Now we're in the tenth thing. Christ will come to do God's will. I've got to hurry. Psalm 40 and verse 7 and 8. Psalm 40 verses 7 and 8. And here we are. Uh, then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is written in my heart. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. Man, here is Jesus, the Son of God, and he's being crucified. We got to go on. Christ will be betrayed. 41 and 9. Psalm 41 and verse 9. Yea, mine own family, friends in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Man, lifted up the heel. Now, these are people Jesus ate with, Jesus walked with, Jesus grew up with, and some in his own family, and so hated him. And so let's go on. Uh, th that was the uh, uh, 11. Let's go to 12. Uh, uh, Psalm 45 and 6. 45 and verse 6. Let's see this. It said, that Thy tongue, O God, is forever and ever. The scripture of thy king, Dung, is a right scripture. Thou lovest righteousness and hast uh, wickedness thereof God, Thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fathers. <laughs> There's a man hanging on the cross and he's anointed with the oil of gladness. See the other end of the thing. The other end of a tribulation. The other end of a tribulation is the good thing. Ah, uh, He was betrayed by his friends, 12. And his, his, his throne will be eternal. 45 and 6. We just read that. Christ will ascend to heaven. Uh, Psalm 68 and 18. We've got to flip over a little bit here to Psalm 68 and 18. Remember now, flipping the pages is the way we do it. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts from men. Yea, for the rebellion also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. If he hadn't gone to the cross, God would not be able to dwell among the people of this earth because it's through the shed blood of the Son of God through Jesus Christ, that shed blood that covers the sin of the whole world. Now we need to go to 14, the zeal of God, which is 69 and 9. 69 and 9. Okay. He said, For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproach of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. When I wept and was chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. Jesus said, I'm ready. I've been offered up, and I'm ready to go, that the whole world may be saved through me. And he left here on the cross. Now, let's see about the vinegar and the gall. 69 and 21. 69 and 21. Now, this is in the Old Testament in the Psalms. We're looking at them. I'm leaving off the New Testament fulfillment, but it's here. You can take your Bible or any Bible with any good notes on it. And everything it says in here in the Old Testament, it will give you a reference in the center. The center thing in these is where you find your reference if you if you want to find your reference. Now we're going to 69 and 21. And that's where we're supposed to be. I'm past it. Oh, okay, 69 no, no, and 21. I'm right here. They gave me also gall for my meat and my thirst. They gave me vinegar to drink. He did not drink it. By the way, he turned his head. He did not take that gall of that vinegar. And he turned his head on that. And so they tried to give it to him, though. And so we know that on the cross. 
Now let's see. Christ is betrayed will be replaced. 109 and 8. My time is running out. 109, Psalm 109 and 8. And running your fingers through the pages. Hey, there's nothing feels any better to me right here than having my fingers in the Bible. I love it. I love it. When I first got saved, I fell in love with the Bible. And uh, what I would do is I could lay my head on it in the summertime. It would be cool. Lay my face on it, it'd be cool. I could lay it on in the wintertime, it'd be warm. <laughs> you say, Brother Peter, you're crazy. I am. I'm crazy for the Lord, though. Uh, I'm a nut, but I'm screwed on the right bolt. How about that? And so here we are, uh, 109 and 8. 109, excuse me. I'm at 108 and 9. 109 and 8 is where I need to be. 109 and verse 8. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. The Holy Spirit. Here, Jesus went to the cross. Now here comes another. The Holy Spirit that was within Jesus himself. The Holy Spirit was in Jesus. But until Jesus went to the cross and shed his blood and forfeited his life, the Holy Spirit couldn't be omniscient. What is omniscient? Or omnipresent. That is in everybody at the same time. Jesus was one person, the second part of God, the second person of God. The third person, the Holy Spirit, is the omniscient part. That's the part that can dwell in every man all at one time. That The Holy Spirit can dwell in man all at one time, all men at one time. And that's the way it is now. That's the one Jesus set free when he went to the cross. He set the Holy Spirit free. Now look at 17. His enemies will bow down to him. Uh, 110 and 1. 110 and 1. It said, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Wow. The King God said to Jesus, Sit down at my right hand, and I'm going to make your enemies your footstool one day. All the enemies of the world will be the footstool for God, for Jesus. They will be under his feet, not in his heart, not under his heart. They will be trampled on, not loved with the heart. The total rejection of Jesus by people today will end up in this place. 110 and 4. I must read this quickly. 110 and 4. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Wow! Hey, Hey, if you you got a minute, search that out. Write down that word. Look at that. Put a circle around that Melchizedek. Color it in with yellow. And then go back to where Melchizedek came to Abraham. And Abraham paid tithes to him. The first time tithes was mentioned, the first time the type of worship was mentioned, was when Abraham uh, met Melchizedek. Because Melchizedek also was the one that came to Jacob. But anyway, we got all those euphorisms are in the Bible, and you can study them. All right, let's go on. Uh, 118 and, and 2. 118 and 2. 118 and 2. My, uh, all these Bibles, I got all the pages stick together, especially the good ones I made with thin pages, and they stick together. 118 and 2. Let Israel now say, that his mercy endureth forever. Oh, that the little place Israel could say that today. They could say it. All that are in Israel could say that today. They could turn out all of the isms and schisms and all the foreign people and all of the foreign things that are in Israel today. They could clean up the city. They could expel everybody that's not a Christian from the city. Did you know that the little old dot, Israel, is the center of the earth? Northeast, south, and west comes out of Israel. 
Did you know that it was God's chosen spot, the center of the earth? Do you know if you'll study that little piece of land, you'll find out it's the focal point of God, the house of God is there in Jerusalem? That when Jesus comes back, he's coming down out of the eastern sky and going to the eastern gate, which, by the way, is probably about 80 feet underground. <laughs> it's about 80 feet underground, that eastern gate. There's one up there, but that's not the original one. Ah, you know, Jerusalem was destroyed some, uh, I forget how many, I don't want to say a number because I just forgot. I just forgot. I, ha I know, but I forgot. Some people say 27, some say 30, different things. All right, he will be the cornerstone, 118 and 22. One, chapter 118 and verse 22. The stone which the builder refused is become the headstone of the corner. The builder of this group of people there in Jesus' day that refused him and put him on the cross, he became the cornerstone of what Peter said. Peter was not the first pope. Peter is not what the church was built on. When he said, upon this rock I build my church, he wasn't talking about Peter. He was talking about what Peter said. Jesus asked him a question. Who you say I am, Peter? He said, I say thou art the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, Peter, but my Father which is in heaven revealed this to you. The Holy Spirit revealed it to you. And that's the way that worked. Now, 118 and 26. 118 and 26. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, which has showed us light, binded the sacrifice with cords, even under the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. Jesus is my God, my Lord. God is my God through the Son of my Lord Jesus. And yours too. Our time has just about come and gone. And I haven't gone to the New Testament scriptures on this. But get you out a Bible or two. But go buy a good one. Go to, you can go to Goodwill and get these. Look on the back and see if it says King James. <laughs> it's surely worth the $2.50 they charge you. If it says King James Version on it, get it and study it. And find more than one. Find several by different people. This one here is put together with, uh, I think, Mr. Schofield's notes in it. Uh, this one other one I've got up here is put together by a man named Mr. Dake with his notes <clears throat> on the side. Many, many references, many charts, many pictures, many all kinds of stuff <clears throat> in it. And this one has all kinds of writing and charts in the back and everything and maps that show you the, the places where Paul went. And then I have this other big nave study. I've got so many study Bibles I can't name them all. But all of them, I use all of them. People think you're a nut. You're some kind of nut, Peter. We do it all everywhere. I look in your eyes, there's Bibles everywhere. Yes, because I don't want to walk by a table or by the freezer or by the bench in the hallway or, or, or by the bench in my bedroom or by a bench up here or by a table or by anything. And I can't flip a Bible open and read a Bible verse. Hey, do you like a good bowl of pudding? That's like reading a Bible verse. You like a bowl of jello? That's like reading a Bible verse. Whatever it is that you like the most in life to eat, that's like reading a Bible verse. Whatever the greatest thing is that you just you just can't hardly wait. Man, I can't hardly wait. I got a friend that said, Man, I can't hardly wait to get one of them shakes from Shake and Steak or whatever it is. He likes those shakes. I tell you what, the shake can be these Bible verses. You jump in here, you got the shake that you need. <laughs> Anywhere you go, there's never a wrong time that you will look 
at one of God's verses in the Bible. There's never a wrong verse, never a wrong time. Day or night, night or day, early morning, late at night, my time's come and gone. See y'all next time. Bye-bye.